Up to this point, the only double integrals we've considered had um, numerical bounds um, for both of the integrals. In other words, we were integrating from a to b and c to d. And in this case, we're going to be integrating from a to b and from some function of x to another function of x, or from c to d and from some function of y to another function of y. So our bounds might not be constants. Okay, now before we talk about what that geometrically represents, we're just going to very mechanically go through the steps for evaluating an integral like this. So in example one here, we have the integral from zero to pi over three, of the integral from zero to cosine y, of x sine y dx dy. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is to think about um, kind of separating this into two um, partial integrals and so we're going to remember that what we're really doing is we're integrating this inner integral first. Notice that it's a dx, it's with respect to x, and so these bounds are actually x values from x equals 0 to x equals cosine of y. Alright, so what we're going to do is hold the y constant as we let um, x vary, and so sine of y is also constant, and so rewriting the outer integral, although it's just going to kind of tag along here, the inner integral is going to become x squared over 2 times the sine of y, evaluated from x equals 0 to x equals cosine of y, and then whatever that result is, we're going to integrate with respect to y. All right, so now that gives us the integral from 0 to pi over 3 of cosine squared y over 2 times sine squared y dy. Bringing the 1 half out front, oops, excuse me, that's not a sine squared. Bringing the uh, 1 half out front, then we have the integral from 0 to pi over 3 of cosine squared y times sine of y dy. Now here we can use a u substitution, letting u equal the quantity raised to a power, or cosine of y, then du is going to be negative sine of y dy. And so making our substitution, we're going to have negative one-half the integral from zero. Now keeping in mind this is y equals zero to y equals pi over three. We can change those to u's if we would like, or we can put the y's back in in the end, either way. So this is going to be u squared du. So that's going to be negative one-half integrated from when y is 0, u is cosine of 0, which is 1. When y is pi over 3, u is cosine of pi over 3, which is going to be 1 half. Of u squared du. So that's going to be negative 1 half u cubed over 3 evaluated from 1 to 1 half which is going to be negative one-half times one-eighth divided by three is one-twenty-fourth minus one-third, which equals negative one-half times negative seven over twenty-four, which equals seven over forty-eight. Okay, let's try another one. In this iterated double integral, we have um, the inner integral is with respect to y this time. And so remember that when we're looking at this, we're thinking of 
the y value varying and the x value being held constant. And we're going to allow the function to vary from y equals negative x to y equals x squared. So just remember these are y equals of y squared x dy. And then we'll worry about integrating with respect to x. So these outer bounds will be x values. All right, so inside of here, if y is what we're integrating with respect to, then we're going to have y cubed over 3 times x evaluated from y equals negative x to y equals x squared. And then whatever that turns out to be is what we'll be integrating with respect to x. So plugging in our top bound minus our bottom, we're going to have the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the 6th over 3 times x minus negative x cubed over 3 times x dx or the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the 7th over 3 plus x to the 4th over 3 dx, which is going to be one-third the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the 7th plus x to the 4th, which is going to be one-third of x to the 8th over 8 plus x to the 5th over 5, evaluated from x equals 0 to x equals 1, which is going to be one-third of 1 eighth plus 1 fifth minus 0. So that will be 1 third times 13 fortieths equals 13 over 120. All right, now let's talk about what these integrals represent. In the previous two examples, we looked at two iterated double integrals, and right now I want to focus on um, what the bounds of those integrals represent. Now, remember that, for example, in the integral on the left, that we have um, the inner portion of the integral that we're integrating first with respect to x. And we said that it was important to realize that that means that these are x values that are ranging from 0 to cosine of y. And the outer integral was taken with respect to y, and so these are y values that are ranging from y equals 0 to y equals pi over 3. So if we were just to graph the... Um, now remember, we're working in 3 space, but what we're doing right here is just graphing that portion of the xy plane that corresponds to these x and y values. So let's start with the y values. The y values are ranging from y equals 0 to y equals pi over 3. Meanwhile, the x values are ranging from x equals 0 to x equals cosine of y. So any point in this region is going to correspond to values within these bounds. Now when we go ahead and integrate a double integral over the, that region, what we're actually doing is we're integrating over the region R described by these bounds and in this case the function that we're integrating is a function of two variables x sine of y so the function z equals x sine of y would be floating around somewhere up here it could possibly dip below the region I'm really not um, trying to be precise as to what's happening above here but up here there would be some function floating around up here and what we're looking at is that portion of the function which happens to lie directly above the region R. So maybe say this portion of the function. 
and by integrating over this region what we're doing is actually finding the volume of the space object the um, space figure that um, has z equals x sine y as the top and the region r as the bottom now if this function and again this is not um, meant to be an actual drawing of x sine y, but if this function happened to dip below, we would get a net signed volume so that whatever portion of the volume was above would result in a positive contribution to the net signed volume, and whatever was below would give a negative contribution. All right, let's come over here to the um, iterated double integral on the right, and again, we need to pay attention to. Um, which bounds are y values and which bounds are x values. Our inner um, integral here is with respect to y, so these are y value bounds and the outer is with respect to x, so these are x value bounds. Let's start with the constant bounds, those are easier to see. So here the constant bounds are the x's, and by the way in an iterated double integral the outer bounds have to be constants. Alright, so we're going from x equals 1 to, uh, or rather from x equals 0 up to x equals 1 and then um, we're told to that the top of our y boundary would be y equals x squared which is indicated here in blue and the bottom would be y equals negative x indicated here in green so from negative x up to x squared so again this is the region over which we're, in, we're integrating. This does not represent the, um, the volume that we're actually finding, but again, if you were to draw this in 3 space with a function floating somewhere up over it, um, then you would have um, an idea of geometrically what this double integral represents.